I am glad that the audience heard all of oh, that no. because uh, <laughs> last week I was hugely disappointed uh, that Amin El Hassan's Antonio Banderas was just so much better off air than it was on air. But I'm happy to be with the crew of Oddball here, Charlotte and Amin, because basketball is upon us. And before I get to the stuff that happens during the regular season. I just want to do one little bit of housekeeping with you guys from the preseason that I have not yet done. Charlotte, are you aware of the work or the name Howard Eskin? Are you familiar with this person? No. Should I be? Um, no, not really. Uh, no, he did is. I just but, embarrassed myself. No, Dan. you did not. You did not. <laughs> uh, he is a Philadelphia radio gas bag from another time. Okay, I took a real risk there. I was debating just being like, yeah, obviously. Vice Commissioner Howard Eskin. Yeah, I'm like, for sure. The owner of the. No, Any, okay. Howard Eskin is a person who sort of personifies, I would say, whatever you think Philadelphia sports radio was in the 80s and 90s. And uh, he is birthed a child, uh, Spike Eskin, uh, from the tree of sports radio. And he is mad because during the preseason, LeBron James on the bench in a yellow warm-up suit was eating something that looked delicious, like a chopped salad or something, or a bowl of some sort. I'm guessing it was something warm because it was in one of those um, black takeout mm -hmm. containers with the clear plastic lid. And that, to me, for some, like a salad to me, I'm like, that comes in one of those paper, cardboard, eco-friendly situations. I think this might have had something more, maybe rice involved. That was my takeaway. The base was, the base was definitely rice. The base rice. was rice. Or quinoa, maybe. There was yeah. carbohydrate, carbohydrates. There was some protein in there. As I told Charlotte, that wasn't a snack. This wasn't him, like, <laughs> having some popcorn. Even the way he starts eating when you when they kind of solo in on him chewing, that's the chew of someone who's eating a meal. It was coal being thrown into a furnace. And <laughs> uh, Howard Eskin writes, total lack of respect for the game and his teammates by LaFraud James. Nice. Also looks like he knows it's wrong, asking teammate to hide him. Surprised he didn't ask for waiter service. And then he does uh, do him the courtesy of tagging at King James. Nice. Uh, cool, cool, cool. What, what are your thoughts there? Just because um, I did think it was funny to see him having what appeared to be a full mall court meal in. On the bench. I have I have the opposite reaction. This gentleman, LeFraud James, no, LeBron James, has been at, this is his 21st season. Let the man eat something on the bench during a preseason game. I also don't think, we have, we've reviewed the tape. We've watched this film. He wasn't asking Anthony Davis to cover him. Anthony Davis was wiping his head with a towel, and LeBron, I think, probably realized someone's seeing this and, and went a little bit behind it. It was convenient. I don't think he was trying to hide it. No, I, I think he just happened to duck behind Anthony Davis as he was going in to shovel yeah. more food in his <laughs> mouth. No, the funny, I, I find interesting Howard Eskin, first of all, going with LaFraud, like, call him LeBron, like, no. I got to come with something more biting, more sarcastic, ooh, witty. Oh, I know what I'll call him, <laughs> LaFraud, because fraud and brawn have the aw sound in there, and it's kind of like it, even though it doesn't rhyme, but it's close enough. And then he said, you know what, but I am still a journalist. I owe him to know I'm talking about him at King James. So you know I speak truth to power. That's that's the where he's coming from right there. He really thinks he did something with LaFraud, and he really knows he did something by tagging him in it. The oldest player in the NBA is where I was headed with all of this. Someone who knows that he has to eat Sorry. early in order to keep his digestive tract right uh, like the old people do before they go to bed so that they can get their sleep right. Uh, I can't believe that LeBron James is the oldest player in the NBA. I can't believe a number of things about him, his entire career, that he's still this successful at this age defies science and physics and all I know about uh, human athleticism. The idea that his team can now, I don't know who you put after Milwaukee as one of the favorites, but I believe the Lakers have gotten well enough and young enough around him that LeBron James is still in the conversation somewhere, which is fairly stunning given his age. And I think their odds are in the top 10 to win the finals. 
Someone that is LeBron Lakers, yeah. right? Like right. The Vegas knows there's a lot of people who are within driving distance who are willing to come and <laughs> lay down lots of money to bet on their favorite team. But it is, it's staggering. It's, I talked was talking about this with Charlotte. He's not just, he's not holding on. This isn't Robert Parrish or Kevin Willis playing in their 20th he's season. He's their, their number two, he's their second best player, not, or maybe their number one he's player. He's their best player. He's their best player. He's he's their best player. He's one of the 10 best players in the league at this age, at, at with this much mileage on him, right? Deep playoff runs, Olympics, national team play. 21 years, and he doesn't miss a lot of time. I think I've at, we've asked the question, when does the fall off happen? And now I'm beginning to think it'll never happen. He'll just be hurt more. That's the only fall off we're going to get. It'll never happen. Uh, He's going to be 80 with a dialysis machine out there, averaging 20 and 10. Because here's the thing, Dan. We talked about this 10 years ago, right, when he was still in Miami. When LeBron gets old, they'll just move him to power forward. And then he'll he'll just dominate. From, when he can't jump anymore, he'll just be flat-footed, but playing out the high post and passing the guys cutting and and scoring on guys who can't keep up with them. And it's like, yeah, I mean, he hasn't even gotten old to the point where say he's got to play power forward. Now, he's still good enough to play wing. So I've resigned myself to thinking the only thing that's going to change, which is the only thing that has changed since he's gotten to L.A., which is he gets hurt a lot now. And when he gets hurt, it takes him a long time to, to recover. That's the only thing I can see. The favorite is obviously Milwaukee, and I saw that Giannis. Is it? Is it over the bet, the betting favorite is, is, is Milwaukee. Yes, according to DraftKings, last time I looked, Milwaukee was the favorite, at least in part because of what I'm about to say. I think mm -hmm. the best teammate Giannis has ever had is either Middleton or Holiday. Correct, ever had, and now he's got a teammate better than that. And in the first game that they played together, Giannis said. He couldn't believe that they started double teaming in a preseason game right off of the first play. They started double teaming Damian Lillard. And I don't know. I mean, maybe you can untangle this one for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much better Middleton was made. I would not think of Middleton as a championship player if he hadn't played with Giannis. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much easier the game has been pay made for Middleton because Giannis is a vaguely unprecedented player in the way that he does things. But having Damian Lillard as his best teammate makes them how much better? What Explain to me how the game is going to change for Giannis because he now has this player better than any teammate he's ever had. So when you look at Giannis, specifically in the Bucks, their biggest deficiency was closing, right? Someone at the end of the game to either take and make the big shot or make the big play for someone else. Middleton, by de facto, fulfilled that role and he did to the best of his ability. And I think Chris Milton's a good player. He's an all-star. He's good enough to be an all-star because he plays on a great team. If he were on a bad team, I don't think he would be, he wouldn't be like Bradley Beal, for instance, where Bradley Beal can play on a bad team and still be looked at as an all-star caliber player. I don't think Middleton is that good, but he's good enough to clearly be an all-star while playing for a good team. Lillard is light years ahead of that uh, in terms of his ability particularly in the clutch. That is his strength. That is his calling card. He is the modern-day Reggie Miller. For people in the 90s, Reggie Miller was the most clutch. For people in the 80s, it was Larry Bird. For people of this era, it is Damian Lillard. And so you gave them the thing that they've been missing all along. And in turn, Damian Lillard, not the greatest defensive player in the world, right? But now he's surrounded with not one but two perennial defensive player of the year candidates in Giannis and Lopez. And we know also from history that, for the most part, when you take a poor defensive player and you put them in a great defensive environment, they get better. Look at what happened to Paul Pierce and Ray Allen when Kevin Garnett came over to Boston. Obviously, Ray Allen came with them, but they've defended better than they'd ever defended before. Look at Allen Houston going from Detroit to New York. Like, these are guys that weren't thought of as defensive players. They were thought about as liabilities. But then you put them in that system. Steph Curry's another one to the point where Steph Curry's no longer a bad defensive player in his own merit. This is a guy who is a good defensive player, particularly in a good defensive scheme. Damian Lillard, I think, possesses all of those same attributes. Someone who can be better defensively if I'm surrounded by the right people. So that's really what they're working with is the 
symbiosis of I do something that you need and you do something that I need. I also think that there's a hunger there. And I think that's what I haven't heard talked about as much from Dame. He needs to win this, win a championship. He needs that for his legacy. I don't know how much he thinks about that. I don't know how much guys think about that. I would think about it a lot if I were him. And I think that he comes in with a fire that Giannis all summer was saying, if you're not serious here to the Milwaukee, to the Bucks ownership, if you are not serious people, I am not going to stick around. And so they listened. And I've said that I said this on Oddball. I think it's astonishing that an organization is well run enough to listen to its star player and get him what he needs. But I don't think we are counting Dame's hunger and desire for this enough when we talk about how dangerous the Bucks are going to be from a basketball perspective. Ben Simmons, what are you expecting from him? Is that a uh, case that is closed? I believe this is just echoing laughter that no one is expecting anything from Ben Simmons. So I was one of the last people off the Ben Simmons train at the end of time, right? I was the one that, even as he was going through his stuff in Philadelphia, said, look, guys, if he plays and never gets any better, he's going to the Hall of Fame because he, put, he defends all five positions at an elite level. He's an excellent passer. He led the league in assists and led the league in assists that led to three-pointers. Um, he's a great rebounder. He's And he, when he puts his head down, he gets to the front of the rim, he, he finishes. It's just this thing has been a sticking point. I'm like, look, he doesn't need any of that. He just needs to play confidently. And then, you know. Yeah, but that's the thing. But, you know, that's the thing. We have never seen but, this kind of mental short-circuiting in this sport. Not Markel Fultz, not anybody. We've never seen somebody be what you just described, which is clear Hall of Famer in terms of physical talent. Oh, the brain power is something that is making him uh, short circuit. Hear me out. What if he had to get to this point where the bar isn't even low, it's on the ground. Mm -hmm. All he had to do is step over it. Maybe he needed to get here, and now he's going to, because there's zero expectation. That's what it is. He is going to be great. I think that's what it is, is he's reached a place where because Kyrie's gone and KD's gone, it's all done. It's over. No one's looking at the Nets as, you guys better do this. They get to play with that freedom of no one's paying attention. You're so, expecting something from him? I uh, I have high hopes for the Nets. I, I, I mean, I think they're going to be fun to watch, and I think they're going to win games, and I think he's going to play well because it's free-flowing and every and there's no expectation. You think no he's going to rehab himself, that Ben Simmons is no longer going to be laughter, that he's going to surprise us, and his confidence is going to be restored? I'll take I'll, I'll die on that hill. I I, I, <laughs> you need to do it more confidently than you just I, did there. Uh, sure. <laughs> you, 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 yeah, yeah you, just, you just died on that hill. A limp, limp death where you fought nothing by your I own bayonet. You just stabbed, your, you stabbed yourself with your own bayonet, lacking confidence. <laughs> she like, charged up the hill with the bayonet. I'm charging up the hill, and you stabbed yourself in the face. No, she <laughs> fell down, and the, the bayonet is in her esophagus. <laughs> Never forget the sacrifice of Charlotte Wilder on this. <laughs> I bled for this content. <laughs> We're going to remain NBA intensive here throughout this hour. Mike Schur will be here shortly to talk Celtics basketball. We got the crew from Oddball in here to talk heat and other things basketball related. But also Jorge Sedano is here and he is going to walk us through some NBA stuff. I don't know how you feel, George, about uh, everything that happened with the Miami Heat and Damian Lillard because uh, a lot of people, I think, are enjoying the fact that they think that Miami got worse. Amin is the rare one with the opinion that the Celtics did not get any better, that the Celtics, he thinks, I don't think I'm misrepresenting him, even though he's sitting right next to me, has a microphone <laughs> and can speak for himself. He thinks the Celtics, because of their injuries and because he has called Drew Holiday a corpse, he doesn't think the Celtics have gotten better. Your general thoughts on the Miami Heat being an eight seed, barely getting into the playoffs last year, was what happened in the playoffs a real indication of who they are, or was the regular season the better indication of who they actually are and now a year older? If you look at the last four seasons, the playoffs are more indicative of who they've been over four seasons, okay, with that particular group, than what that regular season was. They were the second most injured team in the sport. They also had, I mean, it just felt like at times, 
and I hate to say this about a Heat team because no one really associates that with with them, but it felt like they were mailing it in a little bit. Like, guys were sitting out. Like, you know, there's a lot more rest, even though they were injured or whatever. I know that's a taboo topic. But it, it didn't feel like a typical Miami Heat team in that regard. Like, hey, we're going to go hardcore every game, 110% dive on the floor. It just didn't feel that way when I was watching them. It felt like for a Heat team, strangely, they were going through the motions. But I do think that they ascended to the mean, particularly with their three-point shooting. Mm-hmm. And because if you look at Gabe and, and Struess, um, you know, they were terrible during the regular season. And then they shot more like they shot the previous season um, in the playoffs. So they were the number one three-point shooting team the season before last, okay? And they were 26th last season. So I, I, and then you saw in the playoffs, they shot like the number one team. I mean, are you able to discern these things? Because I, generally speaking, I don't have the eyes that you guys have for some of this stuff. I think that when the shots aren't falling, it's easy to say they are mailing it in. I can't tell you that when the shots are falling, they are trying harder. I always think the Heat are trying as hard as they can, and sometimes those shots aren't falling, and then you can make it a criticism. I don't, correct me, but I don't think you're, Mixing those two things up. Those are two different Correct. points. Like, Correct. They didn't shoot as well as they usually do. Also, sometimes George is saying. They didn't look like they were as engaged as they normally are. Two separate things. Yeah. I, I, the shooting part, for sure, because even when you look at the metrics of wide open shots, they weren't making yep. wide open shots. Guys that were traditionally good three-pointers could not shoot. And that changes everything. It changes how the defense guards you. It changes, you know, how they're coming on offense off a of rebound versus off of a make. It changes a lot of dynamics and it would explain why a team could go from the number one seed one year to the eighth seed the next year not because someone had an incredible season in their conference having said all that I think George is right in the sense that these last four years this team has made the finals twice in the conference finals game seven a third like in the third year right and one year they lost in the first round who's been the best team in the conference the last four years Miami it's I mean it's unequivocal Right there. By the way, if you look at the last five seasons Mm -hmm. of the NBA finals, okay, going back to the Toronto series of Golden Mm -hmm. State, there has not been a repeat uh, representative. The only two that have actually been in there a couple times, if memory serves me correctly, uh, more than once are Golden State and Miami. Miami. Yep. So, but that doesn't mean, you know, you can look at the regular season and say, whatever, it doesn't matter. They'll be fine when the playoffs get here because as we saw last year, they were 12 minutes away from not being in the playoffs. Three minutes away. Yeah, my hot take is they're going to get to the playing tournament and lose. And lose. Like, this time, you think, are you one of those? You're, you're one of those people? You think, yeah. like, they're not going to make the playoffs. They're done. They think they're better and deeper. I think they're, they, I think they're they, deeper. They think they're better and deeper. Let me tell you something about Jaime Jaquez, okay? I think that kid is legitimately good. Like, he, I know yeah. we, we, we normally don't think four-year college players are going to be good players in the NBA. This kid is smart. He defends. Like, he is a coach's dream, that kid. He's going to play. Like, no that's, doubt. That's the, that's the, And that says a lot in Miami for a rookie to come in and say he's going to play. I'm wondering how much of my position has to do with being around Heat fans so much. I'm like, has that influence? Because oh, I also, listen. I wonder, I'm like, Amin, are you saying, are you saying the Celtics aren't going to be better because I'm a Celtics fan? Does that play <laughs> any part of it? Yeah, yeah you know, I think we're both being a little bit uh, nudge nicks. Ryan Cortez still calls me a coward because I said in 2017 I'd rather be the Sixers, for God's sake, based on the way the Heat were building with Dion Waiters and Hassan Whiteside. So Heat fans don't love me. Let's just start with that. But I now I don't think Drew Holiday is a corpse, like Amin says. Um, I don't. I, I I have real questions though about yeah, the yeah, Celtics. Yeah. Yeah. I am terrified if I'm a Celtics fan of Kristaps Porzingis. I'm terrified of we've taken our entire identity away on defense, and I'm also uh, afraid of. Hey, we are leading offense because the coach likes offense, and I know that because I've sat with the coach, and I remember having a game where they blew out Phoenix. I did their game, and in that pregame meeting, we talked about like getting shots up, and he's like, no, we need to get more shots up and even more shots up. He's that. That's what he wants to do, and that they've leaned into that. Well, uh, that should be interesting when Van Gundy comes in. <laughs> no, yeah, that will be interesting. <laughs> I'm scared of all of those things too, George. I'm also worried about what movie Joe Missoula is going to watch every night this time. <laughs> yes. Like uh, I said, yes. I was like, after the finals, I mean, after the... Oh, that's the saddest ooh, Freudian ooh, that slip you ever. There. Oh, my God. After the Eastern Conference finals, I was like, this man needs to go home and watch... Uh, Manchester by the Sea every night until the season starts. 
get the sadness out now, yeah. and then we come in, yeah. and it's only Ted. But he's a I, listen. I know people think he stinks. I think he's a good coach. I do too. I don't think he's like. I I feel like the takes were too harsh right. on him. He was clearly in over his skis against yeah. Spolstra um, early in that series, but they had the better team on paper than Miami did last don't, year. Don't don't tell that to Will Manso. He got upset when I said <laughs> <laughs> I said the Celtics Listen, are clearly more talented. I, I, they are, and I love Will. Um, you know, but the reality is the Celtics. Were, there are a lot of teams that are more talented on paper than right. Miami. Um, Miami's secret sauce is not such a such a secret anymore is eric it's bolster yeah it's it's execution it's it's their attention to detail and their ability to execute is why they are consistently why when dan says who's been the best team in the east over the last four years yeah the answer is miami not because of talent although they do have some talent but because they execute they pay attention to detail they do the thing that they set out to do more often than anyone else. I'll ask you guys this, and I feel like Amin will have a good answer on this because he's worked in a front office. Miami, what they do best is they know their guys. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, they know how to find their guys. Those All those diamonds in the rough everyone talks about, the development, they're the best at it because they know exactly what they need to fit around the pieces that they have. And I feel like it's elementary to think that every general manager and every front office thinks that, but I feel like sometimes they... They get away from that and dive into just talent accumulation. I think that's 100% correct. I think the thing that I have said in my career of talking about sports more than anything else I've ever said is that environment determines so much more about behavior than individual characteristic or talent. You can have all the talented guys in the world. If you don't know what your mission, vision, values are, you're gonna you're not going to succeed because that's the cohesion. That's what makes everybody rise up and and as much as it pains me to say it because heat culture has become you know oh heat culture (laughs) it's so real it's so real like all the gms on the gm survey um i think it was like 99 percent when i said eric spolster when i uh which coach has that dog in him no, that, that was not the question. <laughs> that was that not the great question. question no GMs were I asked. want that question on the <laughs> survey prefer, next I year. I that. Which I'm, coach has the yeah. dog in him? Ruff, ruff, ruff. George, we're in a group chat with George. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Anytime, I, I'm a big fan of dogs in him. Anytime, yeah, anytime the Heat are doing something or whatever, he'll send this gif. It's this... A dog. dog with sunglasses on. Yeah. And, and I'm so done with it this. It tilts its yes. sunglasses down. I'm, I'm done with I'm him, and I'm done with a dog in him. I can I can have those I will eradicated never, from ever, the lexicon. Ever be done with a dog in him ever. There yeah. is always the dog. I, I'm with Charlotte. I miss Marcus Smart every day of my life. Hey, he's gonna be good for Memphis because yeah. he's got that dog in him. Dan, <laughs> don't be anti-dog in him. Okay, <laughs> dog in him is a real thing. <laughs> And it's it's immeasurable. I know you hate intangibles. It may, it may be a real thing. What's not a real thing is no GM was asked. Does Eric Spolstra have that dog Did in him? And there the was not survey? there was not a consensus from the GMs on Eric Spolstra has the most Rottweiler in him. Oh, I think we should let Dan in our group chat. Oh no, man. he'd leave in two me. seconds. I do not want to be in a group chat where there is a dog wearing sunglasses oh, winking at me t- and tilts him. <laughs> tilts. Don't forget the tilt. Great is job, it, of me. Is it a- yes, it is that. Let's bounce around the league real quick. Zion Williamson, David Griffin says it's the first time he's taken conditioning seriously in an offseason. He comes out in the preseason, has four steals in a first quarter. Uh, Zion is going to end up being a Nick at some point, or is he going to make New Orleans be a team that matters? Uh, I, well, I mean, is he going to be a Nick at some point? That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say let's see after probably Thanksgiving dinner. And then, <laughs> oh my God. No, but here's the thing. Like, shaming. the re- well, look, I said I'm gonna stop when the season starts, and I still have a few more hours of Zion fat jokes to get in oh. before I gotta go there. This but is my life every day. Well, not not today's Mondays, the last day. Except not Mondays. Except Mondays, exactly. It's my life since I've been 14 <laughs> had a double chin and was wearing puka shell. <laughs> <laughs> but but the thing about Zion, Dan, you know, because this summer people were talking about, are they gonna trade him? Remember? Yeah. That was a conversation. And the reason why the answer is no is because when he's on the floor, he is legit Hall of Fame caliber. Mm -hmm. No one has averaged that many points on that efficiency in the history of the game. I mean, he's Shaq, but in a smaller frame with more athleticism even than Shaq. Well, not at the beginning. Shaq in Orlando was an incredible athlete. Um, and with the Lakers even, too. But they were the thir- the three seed, Dan, yeah. when he was healthy. They were good. They were good. And when they're healthy of, over the last two or three years, 
They're good. It's just they haven't been healthy a lot. How about Clay Thompson for four years at $30 million a year? Do you guys want Clay Thompson as a warrior four years, 30, 30 $35 million a year? I sort of, I sort of do because I can't imagine anything else. And I think that when he's healthy, he's still, I don't know, the eight, it, it so starts. When he's to, healthy, is I tough know. It's, I, I don't know. I don't have. But he was a, healthy last year. Yeah. Yeah, but he wasn't the same either. Uh, offensively, he was. Yeah. Defensively yeah. is where the slippage has, yeah. has gone. But he was one of the best two-way players Correct. in the league. And I don't think that's ever going to come back. But $30 million when the star player is making 50 or 60 yeah. you know, or more, and like it, that's actually not a terrible deal, I think. Um, and you, you win with your fan base by keeping that core together and letting them ride it out into the sunset. And I'm also, I mean, last week you accused me of being in the tank for Mario Cristobal. I'm in the tank for Clay Thompson, <laughs> A, because my daughter Aria, that's her favorite player, and B, I work with Michael Thompson, his dad, very regularly. Incredible Twitter account back in the day. So biased. Man. I must say, this is journalism. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. I need the help of the group here, Amin, Charlotte, and the newly arrived... Mike Shore, because I want more joy in my life. I want more human interactions. And when I saw Mike Shore, genuinely happy to see him. Mike Ryan steps between us because he's gone full Hollywood, taking meetings with, I got John Wick's guy at the Chateau, Chateau Marmont tomorrow, and I got this person over there. And he comes up to me and he says, are we making hello or are we making content? trying to get me to work immediately because he wants right now as part of the cohesion and tapestry of this hour, our NBA preview to continue right now in this hour with Mike Schur and to do Celtics basketball now because basketball tips off and he wants us to have serious sports content. Yeah, and I thought it was particularly odd that he had those knee high boots and the pants tucked in and a little beret with the little bullhorn when he yelled at you. And a riding crop. He had a riding crop at his side. And as he was smoking and he kept yelling cut. <laughs> Can you explain to me, Mike, sure, if you've ever seen this happen this quickly to somebody upon stepping foot in Hollywood, the power going immediately to their head? You've seen plenty of superficiality in this city. This city will ruin people, I'm telling you. You know, you land here and you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed just off the plane from Miami, and you, you take one look around and the glitz and the glamour of Tinseltown, it just, it's like a virus, man. And I, I worry for Mike. I don't think there's any coming back from this. Oh, that glitters isn't gold, Dan. Just remember that. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, are we going to do Celtics preview here? Because Charlotte just looked at Mike oh, and said... Wait, what did that mean? All the glitters is not... What, how, in, in what way was that, was that contributing to the bit? Hollywood, baby. <laughs> Are you in, you're in character as what? What are you in character <laughs> as right now? He you're doesn't just, even know. That's not a character. I'm just, <laughs> I think you're right. He doesn't even I don't know. Think he, he, knows. he doesn't know. <laughs> I like see the look in his eyes when he doesn't know. And he doesn't know. So all of us, let me, let me just see if I understand what happens there. Hold on. You thought that the audience watching this right now would say, Amin is deep in character right now, 1930s, 40s, Hollywood agent. And what he's going to say is a phrase that's so old that you're going to think it's a cliche, but he's thinking he invented it because he's from the 20s or 30s, and this is the first time anyone's heard all that glitters is not gold. You all the character back work for him, Dan. Yeah, because typically I do that character, I did that character off camera. I, I've never, I don't think I've ever brought that on camera. Yeah. Have I? On main show? On main show. I've never done it on main show. On Oddball, you I do, do it a lot. The, the Charlotte, Charlotte, you got to be a star, Charlotte. Charlotte, this talent was made for you. You got to listen to me. I, I'll take your career places you never even seen. Charlotte, you got to trust me though, Charlotte. You got to trust me. Like, I do that. I mean, that would have been good. Or, <laughs> that, all of that would have been super helpful if I had known hey, all of that. Let, Danny boy, let me tell you. This town, all that glitters isn't gold. That, that's an amenism. You could take that one to the bank. I know, but it's not helpful if I don't have the previous... Charlotte, you were happy because Mike sure is here and you can finally celebrate uh, Celtics basketball in a safe environment without without the defensive Mike Ryan, who when he's not going Hollywood is going to attack your face telling you how much better the eight-seated Heat were last year, even though he didn't believe in them at all except for six minutes. Well, yeah, I'm either, anytime I'm on the show talking about the Celtics, I'm either being told I'm not sad enough mm -hmm. or my expectations are too high, mm -hmm. which feels like a bar that is just, there is no bar. The bar is like ether. The bar is just like floating around. And now, for the first time, I have another Celtics fan sitting next to me in the room. Like, we outnumber 
Well, we don't. Not really. Not really. No. I mean, it's, not it's at least a fair fight, though. Thank you. Yeah. And I, in, I, as I understand it, a means read on the Drew Holiday trade is that it's a bad, it, that the Celtics got worse. Is that your position? My position is I don't understand this unbridled joy and enthusiasm behind this deal. I think they lost depth. I think they're putting their trust in one guy who has shown he's either hurt or about himself for most of his career. I'm talking about Porzingis, Porzingis, right? And when you talk about Drew Holiday, this is someone who is not as good as he used to be, but he's pretty much bartering off of this past reputation. Defensively, I mean, we saw it. The last time we saw Drew Holiday on a basketball court playing defense, the guy he was guarding was screaming at him, you can't guard me. Like, that's a pretty damning indictment. And then offensively, he's been on a downslide for years, but people kind of gloss it over, I think, for two reasons. One is he's genuinely a great human being that you want to root for, right? And two is Celtics fans are searching for something to fill the Marcus Smart-sized hole in their heart. I... <laughs> and Drew is like gives you glimpses, reminiscence of, oh, yeah, I remember, the, I remember how that used to feel. Like maybe he can be like my ex, but he's not your ex. He's not. But let me ask you this, though. Objectively, forget about uh, the 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 love you have for a specific player as a fan of a team. If you were just an NBA GM and all of the players were in a giant pool and you were drafting and it came to you and you needed a guard and, and Drew Holiday and Marcus Smart were both available, who are you taking? At this stage right now, yeah. I'm taking Marcus Smart. Really? I'm taking Marcus Smart. Even though he shoots like 30% from three. I get it. I get it, but... but... He but he earned those. Yeah. Anytime, anytime, anytime Marcus Smart took a three, I'd be like, ah, and then I'm like, oh, but he, but he's so cute, but he, but he did so much on defense, let's just let him have it. And then when he hits it, you're like, oh, yay! That is how it is. That, she just articulated it. I feel like that's what about Celtics fans feel about Marcus Smart. He's adorable, he's ours, he's so gritty, oh, he's not good enough, the Heat are better, send him away. Yeah, no. no. There's no send him away. I had no send him she away. She was crushed when I he was, got sent I away. I was devastated. When Legitimately he, sad. Yeah. But that's the difference between fan base and management. Management was like, no, we need someone better. We think Drew Holiday is better than Marcus Smart. I think there was something else important going on mm -hmm. that, can, that helped me get over this, because okay. I loved him too, which is it seemed like from a lot of anecdotes that came out during the season that there was this problem, which was it was Marcus's team, mm. and everyone was deferring to him all the time, especially when he was on the court. But when he wasn't on the court, he was pouting because he wasn't on the court. And then when he was on the court, there was this sense of like, well, w does Marcus think that what I'm doing is okay? And that's why at key moments, multiple times in the playoffs, the worst shot that was taken pos that was to win a game was a Marcus Smart three, and that was the shot that ended up getting taken. That's a problem. And it, and there was that anecdote where Joe Missoula, uh, where where uh, Butler was going crazy in the Heat series, and Jalen Brown went over to Joe Missoula, I think, and said, hey, I want to guard Butler. And Joe's response was, ask Marcus. Wow. So that's not good. And so if that's the situation, it's not just to me about what he did for the team, his abilities even, his position on the team, it's like, this has to become Tatum's team. And if Marcus was there, I don't think it was ever going to become Tatum's team. And so I think that maybe there was a little bit of that calculation going on here where let's get a guy who I think is a, I think as a total package is as good or better than Marcus Smart as a player. And it might be a kind of even, it might be that they needed to trade him to allow the team to fully I mean, emerge. He's making an argument on behalf of chemistry. He's making yeah. an argument on behalf of office politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and like that isn't that the isn't the NBA the place where that stuff matters maybe the most of any sport? Absolutely, and I, th and I think that is a a strong argument to make, except for the fact that people tend to focus on the parts that they don't like, right? They oh Marcus said Marcus takes bad shots and everyone defers to Marcus, and but Marcus is also the guy when they're who calls them out, and I don't know if Drew Holiday is going to do that. Right in in a Sam way, Sam Hauser's gonna do yeah, that. Yeah, there you go. Or Peyton Pritchard, <laughs> who just, the newly the newly minted Peyton, Peyton Pritchard. I mean, Peyton Pritchard. He did well for us. Have I watched some of those highlights multiple times? Yeah. Yes, yeah. you have. I know because I, I have too. Yeah. <laughs> is that our is that our hope? Maybe. Wait, but can you guys really walk me through this? He's making the argument on behalf of, hey Tatum, 
Jalen Brown, you're not leader enough, tough enough to wrestle this team away from Marcus Smart. We're going to send him away. Grow was, up and do it yourselves. He was, the, he was the longest tenured guy on the team. He was the toughest guy on the team. He was the big brother of the team. And so and like that, and he did it really well, I think. And it's not that you need to you can't have that. You you do need that, I think. It's just that as long as he was there. There was good. There was no chance that it has to. Tatum has to take over. He just has to take over that team. I think. I think when that becomes the ceiling, when Marcus Smart's ability, because of his influence on the team and because of the psychological role, I can see what you're saying. It's like you have to be able to move beyond that. And if he is controlling things and he's not comfortable moving beyond his own ownership of this thing then you do start running into problems. And I don't, you know, I, I wasn't in the locker room to, to know where that line was, but that did that did make me feel better, Mike. <laughs> I, I did like what you said. You I'm like, oh, okay, maybe. And then, I mean, here's the other thing. If you had, same thing, you're a GM, all the NBA players are in a pool. You have, there's Time Lord and there's Porzingis. So, no, knowing both of their injury mm -hmm. history, who are you taking? See, this is the interesting thing because Robert Williams has basically a clock yeah. on his knee. Yeah. Like, it's it's going to get worse because he had the removal and not the repair. And so this d degenerates over time. So, you, yes, there's an argument you got to move him when his value is at its highest, and this is where it is. Having said that, however many games that dude missed in the, in the regular season, he plays in the playoffs, and he's incredibly impactful when he plays. Yes. yes. And Porzingis... You can't say that about him because he's been on teams that haven't been good enough to go to playoffs. And when they do, he hasn't really done much in that regard. And also, not exactly a vision of health either. My biggest thing is when I look at the Celtics, three guys they lost, Smart, Williams, and Williams. And that's like, they're three toughest guys with the biggest, to use a Sedano phrase from earlier, dog in them. They got the uh, dog in them. I brought oh, that up. Oh, yeah. so. That's right. I'm sorry. Thank oh, you. Classic, women in sports. Classic uh, women in sports. No, but Sedano, Sedano's always texting know, the I'm, dog gist I know, and I know, stuff. I, so. I hate it. You guys need to stop with the dog. No. In them. I, I, I agree. Never. You, I agree. You gotta stop. Enough of this. Yeah, but I will, I, I will say, though, what Amin is saying there is super interesting because people got on me for saying the Heat just broke up that team. Now, I'm doing that provocatively just to be an asshole, but the— they did take away the three pieces that were the toughness pieces, and now Mike Schur is in here arguing to me, hey, Tatum didn't have the strength to take the team from Marcus Smart. It had to be given to him. It had to yeah. be handed over to him so that he can be the boss. I'll say something else. Grant Williams has that dog in him, <laughs> correct. However, Grant Williams is also the guy who, when he was fouled and was getting taunted on the court, was very clearly mouthing the phrase, I'm going to make them both. I'm going to make them both. And then he missed both. So, like, the dog in you gets you to a certain level of success. And then also there need to be people who actually can make free throws. And so, I, I look, I would rather have when, when it's, and it's just preseason, Celtics are running their offense. It's basically, as far as I can tell in my limited knowledge, the same offense they were running last year. But there's like, there's the ball swings around, there's penetration, the ball gets kicked out. It's now in the hands of, of Porzingis, who shoots 39% from three, and instead of Marcus Smart, who shoots like 14% from three. But they're cute. <laughs> so I look, all this <laughs> stuff, them. all this stuff is real. All this, like, they are the, those were the three of the toughest guys on the team. But the skill on the court right now, to yeah. me, is seems better. And I think at a, this, team has been so close for so many years now they've played deep into the playoffs every year for seven years and i think something had to change that's my that's my optimistic he makes a good I feel argument amazing now he makes can a good I argument leave? can i leave on this high note <laughs> I, I, I feel incredible he makes a good argument right up uh, juju put it on the pole please does that dog in him have a good free throw <laughs> shooting percentage? Can the dog shoot free throws? <laughs> again? Because, because he's so right about this. Like, I don't know if they're... It doesn't seem like they're going to be tougher. I, I find that hard to believe. Unless someone else takes a step up and says, I will assume that mantle. Drew Holiday brings toughness. For sure. But I don't need but, him. I just need Silky Smooth Jason Tatum to be really amazing at the end of you, games. And you're also... You're way underestimating how tough Sam Hauser is. All of you. <laughs> and Peyton Pritchard. <laughs> you mentioned that.